All right, those of you who are here, if you can settle down in your seats, please. Um, so before the break, uh, we very, very briefly summarized um, chapter four and looked at the story of Deborah and Barak. Uh, but just to actually look at those verses, you know, in, in a it's slightly greater detail. Uh, so if we were to turn to Judges chapter four, and if we were to look at verse three, that is where it explains to us that the commander of the Canaanite army, his name is Sisera, and it says over there that he had 900 chariots fitted with iron. And um, we see this mentioned in other places in the book of Judges where it talks about chariots made of iron. Um, up to that time, they only had the wooden chariots and, you know, with wear and tear, because they are made of wood, even the wheels, you know, would be made of wood. Uh, you would not exactly have rubber tires and all of that uh, because, you know, those things are uh, were not created at that time, uh, invented at that time. Uh, so um, the chariots were not very fast, very efficient. But once people began discovered iron and once they started using iron for their weapons, um, you know, it it advanced their entire warfare. Uh, it took it up to a higher level. So now they would fit the wheels with the, with iron, so, you know, uh, as a framework around the wood. So now the uh, those chariots would be able to move faster. And so all the foot soldiers who are on foot would be at a great disadvantage. And if you notice, the Israelites did not have any uh, chariots with them. Uh, so they were all literally infantry. They were, you know, on, on foot. So whenever they had to face these iron chariots, it was more difficult for them. They would be more afraid. But God said that he would be with them. So now again, it's a step of faith which they need to take. And so uh, here, Deborah comes to Barak and says, the Lord has commanded this. That would be in chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. She says, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go. Take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and you know, lead them uh, to uh, that particular mountain uh, near the uh, river. So it's, it's, it's the command that she delivers from the Lord. So this was not just a suggestion. The Lord himself wanted Barak, the judge, to go and bring judgment upon these Canaanite people. But Barak was afraid to do that. And he says, if you come along with me, then I will go. Otherwise, I will not go, is what he says. Um, and uh, so in verse 8, you know, uh, Deborah says, no honor will come to you from this conquest. And um, in verses 14 and 15 uh, is where we see what God does. Uh, so if we can have someone read out for us, Judges chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, please. Judges chapter 4, uh, verses 14 and 15. Yeah, even if you don't have the mic, if you know, anyone is willing to read, go ahead. The people online also have their Bibles, so they also will be able to follow it. If we can have someone read out over here. It's, it's, it doesn't matter whether you have the mic, don't have the mic. If you can just read out, please. Can I read, sister? Uh, that is chapter 4. Okay. Then Deborah said you know, to Barak, oh, Can you hear, sister? I'm, I want to read. 
hello yeah yeah the you know the the audio was not very clear um so okay maybe you can read out the next verse i know that i mean the next verse which we require uh, thanks yeah there was a little problem with the audio but it finally actually came through um so yeah the next verse uh, that needs to be read out you know maybe you could do that for us thanks thanks a lot gertrude uh, so yeah um here we see in uh, verses 14 and 15 uh, judges chapter 4 verses 14 and 15 it says has not the lord gone ahead of you so it's not like as if barak is being sent alone by himself the lord has gone ahead of him so whenever there is a uh, conquest whenever there is warfare whenever you go you're facing a situation where you feel the odds are rather high you feel that you will not be able to gain victory the point the script the, the the spiritual point that this you know passage is making is that the lord has gone ahead of you he has gone before you you are just following behind him so he will take care of the details he will ensure the victory all you need to do is play your small role you know do your part so it it says that the lord has gone ahead of you and uh, when they reach that place when they reach the kishon river god has already made arrangements for the defeat of the enemy barak did not know the details barak was just asked to step out in faith but god had already arranged for a mud slide who knows how many days before that you know already somewhere higher up in the valley the river uh, has been blocked uh, and um, so there has been some kind of a mud slide and uh, you know in the catchment area higher up uh, of this particular river river kishon so now at this point of time when barak and his soldiers arrive at that place and there are 900 chariots waiting for them in that place you know and the and sizera and his Uh, army are very confident that they will have victory because they are the ones with the chariots these are just the israelites are just foot soldiers who have come on foot so they believe that the victory is guaranteed and at that point of time god releases the uh, you know the dammed up waters which have been you know uh, which have been held up uh, earlier on so once that mud slide is released once that mud clears up The, all the water which is collected over there comes gushing down with great force so what do you think would have happened when it reaches this point you know near the foot of mount tabor where all the where, where where the two armies are facing each other all the waters come rushing down and so uh, the waters would have spilled the banks and would have you know flooded the entire area and so because of that these heavy iron chariots get stuck in the mud and it says over there um uh, that you know um sizera he gets down and he starts running away on foot is what it says in um verse 15 it says sizera got down from his chariot and fled on foot a powerful commander is reduced to that condition got to care of the details so barak should not have been in fear he should have obeyed right in the beginning and said yes i will lead he should not have said to debora oh if you come then i will go otherwise i am not sure if i want to go all of that was a lack of faith and uh, so the lord probably would have allowed barak to kill sizera and claim the honor but because of his lack of faith we see that it's a lady uh, we see that later on in verses 17 and 18 uh, you know he goes to the to that tent and it's that lady who kills um, sizera so the details regarding the flood are not mentioned over here in your chapter 4 we only get to know about this uh, in chapter 5 in verse 21 where it says the river kishon swept them away the age old river the river kishon march on my soul be strong so the people the barak and debora sing a song of deliverance in chapter 5 and in the song we have this detail being mentioned that god used the river kishon to cause a flood to defeat the enemy so uh, in the book of joshua and also here in the book of judges 
we see that whenever the people place their faith in the lord and obey him you know uh, with submission then he can do any miracle and the same applies even to us today because uh, the character of our god the power of our god is not changed at all so the kind of miracles we experience today may be different you know at that time um, their uh, technology was at a different level their culture was different so he worked among them in a particular way today he may not bring floods or today he may not operate in the same manner today there would be miracles of a different kind but when god's people step out in faith in obedience and submission then god can cause any miracle to take place because he has no limitations so um, even though such a beautiful deliverance takes place barak gets no honor out of it due to his lack of faith that should not happen to us if we boldly go out and do what the lord says then the lord will see to it that we are honored the lord will lift us up because we placed our faith in him so we should not be um, you know um, living in fear as barak did so that is the lesson that comes through from this particular passage so um, we could just dwell on a few incidents which took place in the book of joshua and we could just maybe look at a couple of incidents which took place in the book of judges moving into the third historical book which would be the book of ruth now why is the book of ruth mentioned directly after the book of judges because they belong to the same time period the uh, this whole story of ruth takes place during the time of the judges which is why this particular story has been you know placed here in our english bibles um so um in judges chapter 3 verses 12 to 30 we get to know something about the judge ehud you know way we are told that ehud uh, defeats the king of moab so at that point of time in chapter 3 judges chapter 3 this is the background that we are looking at of the book of ruth so if you want to know the background of the book of ruth you would look in the book of judges you would look at chapter 3 you would look at the verses 12 to 30 which talk about what took place in the land of moab we see that um, you know the moabites have placed the israelites under captivity they are attacking them they are destroying their property they are doing all of that but god raises up a judge named ehud who goes out and he's able to kill this particular king and we 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 see in verses 29 and 30 judges chapter 3 verses 29 and 30 um maybe we can have someone read out that uh, so yeah we, maybe we could have gertrude read out read out that judges chapter 3 29 and 30 Yeah, go ahead, Gertrude. Which one, uh, sister? Judges. Ah, uh, Judges three, Judges chapter three, uh, verses twenty-nine and thirty. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. and at that time okay. they killed about 10000 men of moab all stout men of valor not a man expected so moab was subdued that day under the hand of israel and the land had rest for 80 years so we see here that for 80 years there is peace established in the land of israel and peaceful relationships are there between moab and um israel so around that time they say is when the famine takes place so there's a great famine in the land of israel but at that point of time israel's no longer under the subjection of the moabites and so they say that uh, this is the background for the book of ruth a man named elimelech takes his wife naomi and takes his two sons and they 
want to escape from the famine which is there in the land of Israel. And so they choose to go and settle down in Moab during these 80 years when there is a time of peace between Moab and Israel. Um, now, would God have approved of Elimelech's decision to take his family to leave Bethlehem and go to Moab? Um, most probably not. Because this is what God says regarding the Ammonites and the Moabites in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 3 to 6. So if we can have someone read out for us, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 3 to 6. Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 to 6. Yeah, if someone can read out. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt, and because they heard her against you, Balaam, the son of Bor from uh, Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loves you. You shall not seek their uh, peace, nor their pro prosperity all your days forever. The Lord is very clear in his instructions regarding the Ammonites and the Moabites. He says in verse 6, Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live because of the way they have treated Israel. You know, when, uh, when the Israelites requested that they would peacefully go through their territory and, you know, they just want to use the road, the highway, uh, they, re they refused to uh, do that. And also they tried to hire a prophet to bring curses upon the Israelites because of all of these things which they have done. The Lord says, do not have any friendship with them. So when Elimelech makes this decision to take his family from the land of Bethlehem and go and settle down in Moab, he's directly going against the will of God. This is not something that he's doing with the Lord's blessings. Because why? We see again and again in the book of Judges, it says uh, there was no king at that time and the people did whatever they wanted, you know, uh, what, what they felt was right in their own eyes. Because at least if a king was there, the king maybe would have imposed the law of God upon them and said, you must keep the law of God. And because there was no one in authority to control them and make them follow the laws of God, the people did whatever was pleasing in their own eyes. And so Elimelech decides that he's going to take his family of all places to the land of Moab. When God said, do not even have any friendship with them, he takes his family and goes and settles down over there. And he goes one step further. He gets his sons married to Moabite women, is what he does. And so obviously the covering of God, the protection of God was not upon his family. And we see that Elimelech dies, both his sons die. And now we have Naomi and the two daughters-in-law left. And um, all, of, all, of, all three of them are now widows. So um, good things do not happen when we deliberately go against the Lord's wishes and, you know, make our own decisions according to what is right in our eyes. Uh, so we need to ask the question, is it right in God's eyes? Does he approve of this decision which I, you know, wish to take regarding my family? So we need to place the Lord's wishes first. Um, so this is the background of the uh, book of Ruth. And the uh, highlight that we see in the book of Ruth is that in this time of judges, where an entire nation of Israelites are living in utter faithlessness, no loyalty to the Lord, no love for God, no, no mercy or kindness towards their own people. You know, when you look at Judges chapter 17 uh, up to verse 21, the horrible stories recorded there, no mercy towards their own people. That is the kind of um, Israelite nation that we see in the book of Judges. In the middle of all of this unfaithfulness, we see a cursed Moabitess coming and showing them how a person should live. So it's very ironical. 
a woman who is not even uh, you know who who is part of a nation that god has condemned she rises up and she presents an example of what loyalty should look like what uh, you know what uh, faithfulness should look like so there's a contrast drawn between the book of judges in which people of god are living in uh, horrible disloyalty and the contrast is with the book of ruth where an outsider someone who has been uh, placed under god's curse she chooses to take a stand and she presents a different picture and she teaches the israelites what loyalty should look like so uh, uh, we see a lot of irony in this in the way god you know um, brings out this story of this woman uh, so so ruth chooses to show faithfulness in a time when nobody even understood what faithfulness and loyalty was um so um if you were to look very briefly at the structure of this book we only have four chapters so chapter 1 gives us the background uh, we get to know that uh, you know all the, uh, the the husband and his two sons are now dead so we have the three widows who are left and um, so naomi gives permission to her daughters in law to go back to their hometowns to get remarried and have families of their own because you know now she has nothing to offer them so she is willing to come back to bethlehem all alone by herself even though she has no help no support nothing so one of the um, daughters in law says all right i'll go back because if she comes over here to the land of um, israel she knows that she is not going to be received well she is a moabitess remember who she is she is a moabitess and the israelites have no respect for the moabites so if she comes over here she will not know the language she will have to learn the language she has to learn the new culture and she is not going to be respected so she decides to go back home ruth on the other hand she looks at this old lady and she thinks if i to go away who will look after her who will be there for her so ruth says i choose to come along with you and even though i am a moabite i will make your people my people i will make your god my god even though god has spoken against that nation and so because of the stand which this lady takes god makes an exception for her and in fact we go on to see what a huge exception god makes for her because god what did he say in deuteronomy you know in the passage that we read he said up to the 10th generation these people will not even end, you know come near my tabernacle they are unacceptable and who is the man who is you know becomes a uh, a king and a priest uh, david who is a descendant of this ruth he is what fourth generation he is not 11th generation so god says up to the 10th generation i don't want any of them even coming near my temple and a fourth generation man he goes on to become a king and a priest to serve the almighty god and fifth generation solomon literally builds the temple for the lord this is the way the lord looks upon those who have a heart to be loyal and faithful and choose to place themselves under him what a contrast between the faithless israelites of the book of judges and this outsider who owes nothing to naomi but chooses just out of the kindness of her heart to stay loyal so it's a beautiful contrast that is drawn between you know these two uh, books so in chapter 2 we see that she goes uh, to the field of boaz and starts collecting the grain which is over there uh, because i mean um, again that we are we are told in in the book of deuteronomy and also numbers where it says uh, when you people at harvest time when you are gathering all your crop you know and getting it ready to sell and all of that don't take every bit of the crop leave some of it over there in the fields so that the poorest of the poor they can come over there and at least take that and you know to their homes and have food to eat you know so uh, it's a it's a commandment which the lord gives don't pluck up every single bit of grain leave some of it in the field so that the poor people can come and take it to their homes so that they can feed themselves so when uh, naomi and uh, her daughter in law come back over here they are in that category the poorest of the poor they have no territory uh, they have no money they have nothing 
so um she says to her daughter in law you know our relative is boaz so maybe he will show you kindness so why don't you go to his fields and you know uh, glean the wheat from uh, glean the grain from his um, uh, fields so which is uh, what we see in chapter 2 chapter 3 is where naomi tells ruth to go and request boaz to become a kinsman redeemer so we will we'll look uh, uh, you know a little bit uh, at those details um, later and in chapter 4 of course uh, they get married and you have obed being born so he becomes the grandfather of david uh, so these are the four chapters so let's understand what this whole concept of kinsman redeemer is all about um i think for us to understand this we we would have to go back to deuteronomy uh, chapter 25 and we have a lot of verses but it gives us a very clear picture of what exactly happened in the story of ruth so for us to understand that we need to look at this passage deuteronomy chapter 25 verses 5 to 10 it uh, so if we can have someone i uh, read out deuteronomy chapter 25 from verse 5 all the way up to verse 10 please concentrate even as we are reading because you will understand the background of this whole kinsman redeemer concept yeah someone can read out deuteronomy 25 5 to 10 if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family her husband's brother shall go in to her take her as his wife and perform the duty of her husband's brother to her and it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother that his name may not be blotted out of Israel but if the man does not want to take his brother's wife then let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders and say my husband's brother refused to raise up a name of his brother in israel he will not perform the duty of my brother's husband's brother then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him but if he stands firm and says i do not want to take her then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders remove his sandals from his foot split in his face and answer and say so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in israel the house of him who had his sandals removed okay so the property in the in the promised land was given by god as a divine inheritance to the israelites and each tribe was given a certain territory and told this is yours i yahweh is giving this to you you know so uh, the land was valuable in god's eyes so each tribe was supposed to hold on and preserve the land which has been given to them so the people who are living the families you know of each tribe which are living in their territories if somebody dies then that property of the dead man will just go off to the brothers so what will happen in the title deed you know in the, in the future generations the name of the original holder of the land will no longer be there now the other living brother whoever you know has taken over the land his name will start coming over there but the lord wants each family to continue having its own property which has been divinely gifted to them and so the lord says if one of the brothers dies don't just let his name be wiped out you know some uh, the one of the living brothers must marry her the widow and the child that is born then the, this property will now go to that child and the child will carry on the name of the original holder of the land so that in the title deeds the or, the name of the original holder of the land will continue so it's like a divine duty that god is placing upon the um the living surviving brothers what is the disadvantage for this living brothers you see what would happen is if they um don't put the 
property in their own name rather if they continue to allow that property to be in, in the name of the brother the future uh, descendants will not gain so this living brother you know will invest in the land he's the one who will provide the fertilizers he's the one who will provide the cattle you know to do the uh, to to plow the land and all of that he's investing a lot into that land but it's not going to be in his name it's going to be in the name of the dead brother so in a way it's financially not very profitable so a uh, so some you know like it says over here in this deuteronomy passage a brother living brother may say no no i don't want this responsibility you know i want the land but i don't want to marry the widow and then you know it will it will no longer be the property will not be in my name i am the one who's buying it but it will no longer be in my name and it will continue in the name of the other brother so if someone says that it says in the deuteronomy passage the widow actually has the right you no know, it says first that the elders will try to persuade the man and tell him this is your responsibility this is something you should do god wants you to fulfill this but if the man still refuses then it says that this widow has the right to actually go over there it says that she can take the sandal off his foot and spit in his face and say this is what is done to the man who will who will not build up his brother's family line and the you know uh, there's this a uh, negative um, uh, name that is given to that entire man's family it says he will be known in israel as the family of the unsandled this was a kind of symbolic thing um he is if if he has fulfilled his responsibility it's like he has both his sandals he has done something honorable but if he has failed to fulfill his responsibility it's like his sandal has been removed he has lost his honor now all of this background becomes important when you are trying to understand the story of ruth because that's exactly what happens in the story of ruth so we know in the story of ruth uh, in chapter 3 uh, naomi says to ruth you know this uh, boaz is showing kindness so maybe he will be willing to redeem the property which my husband had lost when elimelech was leaving bethlehem and going away to moab he would have sold the land to somebody and with that money they would have gone and settled down in moab so now the property is no longer in their family anymore so so her hope is that boaz will buy that land put it in the name of her dead son and continue fulfilling the responsibility that is her hope so but she's not very sure whether boaz will say yes or not because boaz is a wealthy man he has got enough fields will he be willing to take on this responsibility buy the land from whom to whomever they had sold it buy it back from that person invest in it and not put his name on the title deed will he be willing to do all of that so she comes up with a very very um, unpleasant scheme she says you know in the night time when he's sleeping over there in the warehouse you know that's basically the harvest season so you know all the crops will be piled up over there all the grain will be piled up over there so he probably would go and sleep over there to guard the grain so she says when he's sleeping over there you go over there and sleep because then you know he when he gets up in the morning and sees her over there you know he may feel kindness in his heart he'll not want her name to be disgraced so then he'll be willing to marry her so she's coming up with this very very disgusting scheme actually instead of that if she had just you know honorably decently gone up to boaz and you know opened her mouth and said you know we want you to be the kinsman redeemer i'm sure boaz would have said yes there was no need for her to try this uh, very unpleasant scheme to pressurize him into saying yes in fact when boaz sees her lying over there he's shocked and he says before any of the others see you you know go back go back home which is when she opens her mouth and says please we want you to be the kinsman redeemer are you willing to take this step for us and this is what he says to her in chapter 3 he says what an honorable woman you are he he says that once earlier to her in chapter 2 he says you know you came back over here and now you're looking after your mother in law what a what a honorable person you are you know he praises her in chapter 2 and he says the same thing in chapter 3 he says i'm an old man now and you're willing to marry an old man just to do this for your mother in law what an honorable person you are and he says there is a younger person someone who's a closer relative than me 
he should actually be fulfilling this responsibility so it would be good to you know if she can marry a younger person rather than marry an old man so he says i will go speak to this kinsman redeemer and if he is willing to do it good but if he refuses then i'll take up the responsibility i will you know uh, you know uh, help you regarding this matter so we see all of those things happening in your chapter 4 of um, uh, this book of ruth where boaz goes to the elders who are sitting you know at the town gate and he calls this man who is the closest relative and he says to him see this property was sold by elimelech to some person and now uh, are you willing to buy it back are you willing to redeem the land and the man is very happy i mean he doesn't mind so he says yes yes i'm willing and then boaz says but one condition you'll also have to marry the widow of uh, you know mahalon mahalon is the son uh, so but if he marries the widow then that property will no longer be in his name it will come into the name of mahalon so he will his his descendants will not gain from that property so when he hears this condition being put uh, so in verses in chapter 4 in verse 4 he says um, i will redeem it okay so um, boaz says to him if you will redeem it do so but if you will not tell me so i will know for no one has the right to do it except you and i am next in line and the man says i will redeem it then in the next sentence in verse 5 boaz says then in that case you must also marry the widow and then once he hears that this is what the man replies he says in uh, ruth chapter 4 verse 6 he says then i can't redeem it because i might endanger my own estate you redeem it yourself i cannot do it is what he says because he is going to be investing a lot into this land but uh, he is not going to gain his descendants are not going to gain anything out of it so he says no i don't want to do it uh, so then boas you know honorably steps forward and he says yes i will do it so he takes on the responsibility and look at the outcome of that um when we look at the genealogy uh, which is you know mentioned later uh it in the genealogy technically speaking you know it should say that obey you know when 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 the when the child obey this born in the genealogy it should be written son of mahalon because you see this marriage is being done to continue to extend the name of mahalon but god makes an exception over here he decides to put boaz name directly over there so over there in the genealogy it does not read as obed the son of mahalon rather it directly says obed the son of boaz so god so you see two things god is doing first he made a commandment regarding the the moabites and he decides to go back on that you know make an exception for ruth and her family and now again we see god making another exception the name of mahalon should have continued but because of the honorable manner in which boaz you know uh, chooses to become kinsman redeemer uh, his name is uh put in the genealogy rather than mahalon's name and uh, the child which is born is called son of boaz rather than being called son of mahalon so what lessons come across from this when a person chooses to honor god even in normal earthly you know um uh, things over here there's no uh, spiritual war being fought you know there's no great uh, religious ceremony being conducted normal everyday things buying of land helping a widow you know showing kindness to someone who doesn't uh, have anything in their hand very normal everyday activities are going on but there's a god watching from above and when he sees the conduct of these two people boaz who's honorable in the way he treats this uh, you know the, the, these two widows and ruth in the way she treats her mother in law very small incidents these are not great warriors who went into battle and did great things they did something very ordinary most people would not even have observed what they did but god noticed he completely changed their history their entire future was changed 
because of the heart which they had. So imagine the value of the little decisions that we take in ordinary things. There will be great battles, of course, which we will face. And you know, we will go out in the name of the Lord and conquer those. But everyday things also matter. The Lord who was watching the heart of Ruth, the Lord who saw how Boaz showed honor and kindness and help, you know, when that other kinsman redeemer was not willing to do his duty, the Lord observed all these things and the Lord lifted up these people high, very, very high. So that even up to this day, their names are remembered, their names are known. That man who said, no, I don't want to take up this uh, duty, we, he, his name is not even mentioned. We don't even know who he is. He just passed into history. And nothing great happened to him or his descendants. On the other hand, Ruth's lineage, a Moabite her from her lineage come the people who actually honor the temple, build the temple. And uh, God chooses to attach his name to such people. Because when you come down to it, David is half Israelite, but is half Moabite. And the beauty of, you know, we see of how God looks at the heart. So, which is why this should remind us of that uh, Jeremiah passage, you know, where uh, the Lord says, look, you are like the clay, you know, in the potter's hand. And if I have declared judgment against you, but if you repent and you change your ways and you turn to me, I, the potter, can use this clay instead of making it a vessel of judgment, I can make it into a vessel of blessing and bless you. So we all are like the clay in God's hands. And these little, little decisions that we take regarding how we treat the people whom we know, the loyalty and the kindness that we show, God is looking at that. And so even if judgment has been spoken upon us, God will say, I will change my mind. And rather than bring wrath upon you, I will bring blessing upon you. And that is what we see happening to Ruth. Ruth was clay in his hands and judgment was spoken upon her and her entire nation of Moab. But because of the heart which she had, God changes his mind regarding her and uses her lineage to bring out his Messiah. I mean, uh, the ultimate honor was given to this outsider, to this Moabite person. So uh, let us be very aware that we are clay in his hands and he's watching to see how this clay will behave. Are we going to be uh, living in a way that honors God in small things? Nobody in the world will care what you're doing with, you know, to, to your mother-in-law. But the Lord who is watching, he cares. For him, it matters. Nobody will care whether one field got sold or not. But God who's watching, he saw Boaz's honorable attitude in helping these two widows and in purchasing the land. And so God puts his name in the genealogy, not Mahalon's name. And so we see all these outworkings of God's uh, you know, uh, glory in the middle of this judges period where people were filled with disloyalty and unfaithfulness. And here you have two people shining examples of what loyalty should look like, Boaz and Ruth. We see the story of these two people. Uh, so that would be the main learning that comes out from this book of Ruth. And so um, we have this very superficial interpretation of the book of Ruth, where they say, oh, Ruth, the love story. This is a love story, but it's not about the uh, you know uh, old Boaz and Ruth. This is a love story of the love shown towards a widow named Naomi. She says, I, my name is supposed to mean pleasantness. Now, there's no pleasantness left in my life. All I have is you know, uh, empty hands. She says, there's nothing in my hands is what she says in chapter one. You know, so, so she says, call me bitterness from now on. And uh, Ruth shows kindness, love and loyalty towards this widow. And Boaz does the same thing. So yes, it is a love story, but it's uh, a story of the love and loyalty shown towards a widow who comes back to her, uh, to her nation with nothing, empty hands. You know, and um, her husband is dead, her sons are dead, and we see faithfulness being shown 
towards her and god um rewards the people who you know who show this kindness so which is why i uh, the word the term kinsman redeemer is also used for you know christ so in the same way boaz even though he did not need to he chooses to redeem that land and marry uh, uh, um, ruth uh, you know because he in the same way he is willing to be a redeemer um, they use this as an example of a you know of christ and they say that boaz is a shadow he is a representation of what jesus christ will do one day where he will redeem people who are not really deserving it if you look at it technically naomi did not deserve all the kindness she and her husband went against god's instructions and went to moab got their children married off to moabites did all of that so even though they did not deserve it boaz shows kindness and redeems in the same way we have christ coming to sinners and even though we do not deserve it he chooses to redeem us so these are all the uh, you know learnings which come out of the um, book of ruth um so uh, if there are any questions uh, we can cover those if someone wants to post something in the chat a question we can address that otherwise i uh, you know we'll just close with a word of prayer that's it i hope you guys were listening so anyway uh so yeah let's close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for the lessons spiritual lessons that we could learn from these three historical books joshua judges and ruth lord we saw in all of these three books that people even though they were put in tough situations when they chose to submit to you and obey you trustingly then the most impossible miracles happen for them because nothing is impossible for you so we pray oh lord that you would help us to live our christian walk in the same way no matter how uh, difficult or unpleasant a situation is help us oh lord to be people who will humbly obey you submit to you trust in you so that you can make the most extraordinary miracles happen for us we ask that you would prepare our hearts and change us transform us into that kind of a people o oh lord thank you lord in jesus name amen all right um yeah we'll continue next week okay uh, those who are in the class you can go ahead and leave uh, there's a person jairam who has lifted a hand so if you have a question maybe you can ask your question quickly if you have raised your hand to ask a question you can unmute yourself and i will address this those of you who are leaving if you can do it quietly please so that i can you know i can concentrate here yeah please go ahead brother if you have a question if you have raised a hand for a question no maybe okay maybe it's just accidentally raised fine all right